One of the myths of ESG investing over the last 30 or 40 years, what there, there, is a, there is a give up essentially with the performance. And it's not necessarily true anymore. 30 or 40 years ago, the types of products that were coming to market were what we would call exclusionary based. So they would just define things as sin stocks, things like tobacco, alcohol, gambling, nuclear weapons, things like that, and simply exclude those areas. And then you sort of left with whatever was left over. Now with the mainstreaming of what we would call ESG data, we can actually compare companies against each other. So I can compare a technology company against a technology company and an energy company against another energy company among the ESG pillars and I can select the better one. So transitioning from that exclusionary approach to a best in class approach where we're including the ESG leaders allows us to increase an ESG score, lower a carbon footprint, but still have the risk return characteristics that you would expect from a non-ESG product. We think it's growing because there's, there's interest from two distinct groups of people. Uh, millennials being one, where 90% of, of millennials are invested in incorporating or interested in incorporating their personal beliefs into their purchases and into their investments, as well as women investors who are not far behind that 90%. Women investors now control more than 50% of the wealth in the country. So between those two groups, we see a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of interest in this space. I think ESG will continue to grow. Um, one, of, one of the trends, I think, is there are more and more products coming to market. I would encourage everybody to make sure they're diving into the methodology to understand what they're actually investing in and the differences between one or more products that may be branded similarly but have some distinct differences.